In the 18th century, Philadelphia was the birthplace of our nation. It was the second largest English-speaking city in the world, and the Declaration of Independence was adopted right here July 4, 1776. However, the Founding Fathers also had a favorite unofficial meeting place a couple blocks away. John Adams referred to the city tavern as the most genteel tavern in America. It's steeped in tradition and full of history. To celebrate the city tavern, we'll do today a roasted lake of venison, which was very prized in the 18th century and still is today. Yellow beets or gratin, which is yellow beets and walnut. Then we make an, an Irish white potato with sage. So let's journey back to Philadelphia in the year 1773 and celebrate the city tavern for a taste of history. Before I operated City Tavern, I had very little knowledge about the 18th century and the great food that was served during the 18th century. The City Tavern opened my eyes and I will tell you, there was fantastic meals being served in the City Tavern all the time because it was the finest place in British North America, even before the revolution. Venison in the 18th century was very priced and also very expensive. Kind of hard to believe when you envision less population, more forest, but it was always kept at high esteem. So for the first dish that we're making today, which is the main course, it's a leg of venison. There is not much butchering needed. It's just a question of trimming. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to take off the shank. And with the shank, I'm making a little stock. The next thing we're gonna do, we're just gonna take off the outer fat skin. If we don't do that, we won't be able to lard it. The venison itself is very lean. And also the lard that goes in it gives a tremendous amount of flavor. So I got a Dutch pot ready on the fire. All I want to add is a little bit of oil. You could also use schmaltz, but don't never use venison schmaltz. Don't render down the fat of the venison. It will taste like a candle. I got some of the other trimmings I got here. So if you like any kind of special flavoring, that's the time to do it now in the stock. So what I'll do for here, just cut up some garlic. Just cut them in half. You don't need to peel it or clean it. I take a couple of onions, the celery root, which is now readily available. It used to be like an esoteric item. A little carrot, just chop it really quick. I got a couple of fresh bay leaves, and I take a little plum tomato. The meal bar goes in now, just like that. We're trying to get the water out of the vegetable. Vegetables are 80% water. Anybody who wants to make this recipe, the biggest challenge you may have is to find the fat back. Many years ago, it was readily available when it was salt cured. Now, you'll find it in the butcher shop, but it would not be cured, which means it's very soft. So the only way you can overcome that is you take the entire piece of lard and you put it in the freezer, get it really cold, because if you don't, you won't be able to cut strips and then you won't be able to lard the lake of venison. The other thing you need for that is you need a larding needle. You put the larding needle in, you enter the, the fat into it, you close the needle, and you push it through. Maybe five, six different pieces on one leg. You don't need much more. It's just the flavor penetrates in while you cook the venison, and obviously the venison has a lot of flavor on its own already. I've been making venison for four decades, for sure, if not more. Growing up in the Black Forest. The trick I learned early on was pack it with some herbs on top before you even put it in the oven. And remember, when using delicate herbs, don't take a knife to it. Just a little bit of oil, so it coats the venison, it also makes the herb stick. While this cooks in the oven, I'm gonna finish the sauce. So the mirepoix is nicely reduced. Wine for cooking should be the same wine that you wanna drink. Too much wine would be not good either, it's too strong. A little, little water in here. So we let this reduce down, we stew it up. A little sage, a little rosemary, and maybe just a tad of time. So now I'm gonna chop a few of the little onions down. Button mushroom, it's just easy to come by. For this recipe, I would just use butter, no oil or schmaltz. Let it melt down. And remember, I don't want any color on this one here. I just want the onions to be translucent. And all I'm adding now is the mushrooms. It's strain some of this unbelievable stock we made right into it. All I gotta do is let it just cook a tad. Add some heavy cream, and we can slice up the venison. Cut it down on the bone. 
Oh gosh. You cut it down the bias. Ladle some of that fantastic mushroom sauce right down the middle. A few chives on top. And here you are, roasted lake of venison. And it doesn't get better than that. John Adams referred to the city tavern as the most genteel tavern in America. It's steeped in tradition and full of history. Let's check out my city tavern, a triumph of tradition. I've operated this tavern for 19 years. It's a very impressive structure. This is exactly the way the tavern looked when it first opened in December of 1773. As delegates of the First Continental Congress began to arrive in Philadelphia in the fall of 1774, many stopped first at the City Tavern before proceeding to their long-term accommodations. Nothing would ever be accomplished. It was here John Adams of Massachusetts and George Washington of Virginia met for the very first time. Washington was here at City Tavern. He, he actually lived in this building. In 1777, Washington used this as his headquarters for the Allied forces. At the beginning of the American Revolution, delegates from 12 colonies met formally right here at Carpenter's Hall during the First Continental Congress. However, the Founding Fathers also had a favorite unofficial meeting place a couple blocks away, the City Tavern. The Continental Congress would come here and they could discuss what was going on up at the State House a little more relaxed atmosphere. They would have dinner upstairs in the long room. After dinner, they convened down here and more conversation took place over some serious ale. Cheers. Modeled after the finest taverns in London, City Tavern was considered the best restaurant in British North America. Established in 1773 by 53 prominent Philadelphia businessmen and investors, it filled a gaping void for the city's elite who desired fine food and drink and elegant lodging. Yellow beets, which are obviously just a different color, same beets, they're sweet, they're beautiful. You want to roast them until you can penetrate them with a toothpick, then you know they're done. You don't want to overcook them. So all you do, you want to make sure you wash them, a little salt over, just a tad, and just a little bit of oil, very little, not even to coat it. In the oven, you don't cover them, but you got to keep a good eye on them. In a sense, you're going to roast them slowly, and what happens is when you do that, you intensify the sugar. An hour and a half later, there we go. And peeling, you take your hand like that and just slide them over the beads. I'm just reminded again how the 18th century was just a very different way of living. Now I'm gonna do it just basically really simple. Cut them and have a look at the beautiful color of those. Isn't that gorgeous? And then I'm gonna just slice them like so. So I got some walnuts on top. Mortar and pestle. I have some cinnamon that I just coarsely break in here a little bit. Some Old Spice. So all I want to do is break the Old Spice and the cinnamon down a little bit. Nutmeg goes right over. A little bit of the spice on top. Perfect. A few bay leaves on top. So now this is ready to go. All it needs is the sauce that I'm making right now. So all we're going to do for that, we cut some onions, a fine slice. I got my spider getting hot. We're going to make a very easy form of a bechamel. Butter, little onion in there, the sherry wine and cream. Cook it up a little bit. Now in a taste of history, as you know, when you make a roux the old-fashioned way, it burns real easy. So here what we do, we add the roux in it and we reverse the cycle. So I'm just going to add some onion. Now remember, I want this pretty thick. All I'm doing now is putting the cream sauce right on top. And then a good amount of Parmesan cheese. You don't want to be skipping that because the cheese gets the flavor into it. And now I put a little bit of paprika on it. It adds in the browning process. Now in the oven it goes and frankly, all you really need is to get a nice golden brown. Everything is already cooked in there. You get a pizza that are cooked, you get a bechamel that's cooked and you have the walnuts. Now I want to concentrate on the potatoes. One of the potatoes that is Thomas Jefferson's favorite, also my favorite, is what I call an Irish white. Now, if you cannot find an Irish white, close to it is a Yukon. 
But remember, the Yukon is more golden when the Irish white literally is white. Look at that. When I make those potatoes, I use schmaltz. The potatoes I put on the fire already a while ago, cook them with a little bit of salt, nothing else to it, and I cook them a little bit, not al dente, but not overcooked. Pepper. I have the oil hot, but you don't want it too hot, because then it's going to kill your herb too quick. Give it a little bit of a blanch, and now, put them right in the potato, Show them a little bit, and we're ready to plate up. So this is my tribute to the city tavern. A roasted leg of venison, my favorite, favorite Irish white, and obviously the favorite winter casserole, the yellow beets. So let's go back and explore the rest of this one-of-a-kind city tavern. Ideally situated on the banks of the Delaware River, Philadelphia quickly became an important trading and information center for sea captains and merchants. The most important room of the city tavern would have been this room that we call the subscription room. The sea captains would come in here, bring the mail from the old country, newspapers, new maps, discuss new avenues of sailing their ships and a safe way to come here. So this, in a sense, was the communication center of the 18th century, the link between Europe and British North America. Former mayor and one of the tavern's original proprietors, Samuel Powell, took complete ownership of the building in 1784. He soon established what could be compared to today's commodity exchange right on the first floor. I can imagine how much money changed hands in these rooms. Everything that came to the harbor, a stone throw away, would have been haggled in these very rooms. No, 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 it is the Congress. The most important room for many people is the top room in the tavern. Obviously, we have fantastic ales here. This gate here was to protect the barkeep. Imagine at 2 o'clock in the morning, you don't want to give somebody another drink, and it wouldn't sit well. The room we're standing in right now is the long room, second largest ballroom in British North America, second to Independence Hall. The meals was differently served than we serve them today. There was no such thing as an individual menu. It was uh, maybe three courses to two courses, depending up to 20 different dishes. The finest of the food was served here, and a lot of beverages along with it. This room is called the Charter Room. It's as popular today as it was when it first opened in 1773. The Charter Room was reserved for the Charter Group, each member investing 25 pounds. Wow. All the breads of the 18th century were very dominant. And for this reason alone, I built a very state-of-the-art pastry shop, not only for breads, but also for all of our homemade desserts. Diana. Hi, Chef. We have many fantastic desserts in the City Tavern, but the one that raises eyebrows all the time is the creme brulee. You should make this at home without any problem. It is very simple. It's just important to start with very good ingredients. Whole fresh eggs, 40% or more heavy cream, which is just your standard heavy whipping cream, and really good vanilla beans, which are my favorite, of course. So we have four egg yolks. Go straight into this bowl. And in our pot here, we have our cream, one whole cup into our pot, and then one half cup. We'll pour and set aside just for a moment. In with our cream, we'll go half of our sugar, that's three and a half tablespoons. We'll just sprinkle that in, just half, leaving the rest for the yolks. And you can't put it in right away, otherwise you get what's called sugar burn, and it just creates a lumpy mixture instead of creamy that you're used to with creme brulee. And our vanilla bean, just gonna cut the tip off on one side, lay it flat, and just cutting through with the tip of the knife in through the top of the vanilla bean. And there you have it, black gold. And we'll toss the shell in as well. That is beautiful. That will, you know, allow the cream to extract the rest of the seeds from the vanilla bean. So we'll give this just a quick whisk, break up the seeds just a little bit. Combine the sugar, and we'll set this over the heat, yep. if you would do that for me, just until it simmers, so just a little bubble right around the edge. We have our four egg yolks in this bowl here, 
And we're just going to add the remainder of our sugar, sugar. Mm -hmm. with our whisk. Add the sugar, drizzle in the cream. So now what you have here is a cooled egg mixture instead of just the egg yolk for when you pour in the hot, it won't burn the yolks and scramble the creme brulee. So we're ready to add our hot cream. We have our strainer here. I'll give that to you. you and can, I'm going to strain in yep, your... Yep, strain uh, it directly in. Perfect. We'll whisk this back together. And these are about four ounce servings, I believe. And now it's going to go in the oven. That's right, on a roasting pan or brownie pan or something that has an edge so you can fill it halfway up the side with water. And we'll put them in the oven. You don't want to put your water in until you get them in the oven. Otherwise, chocolate. Otherwise, they spill. And if you get water in the custard, it will never set. And temperature, and how long? 325, half an hour. You'll be able to tell when you shake them, and they will no move. longer wobble. And then All right, so let's stick it in the oven. Let's do it. All right. So you can see how it nicely set up. This is so easy. So when you get it like that. You know it's done. So we have just a little bit of granulated sugar here. That seems to work the best. If you use brown, it can burn. Uh, so just stick with your regular granulated sugar and just lightly sprinkle it across the top. You want enough of a layer so that you don't actually burn the custard. You only want to be burning the sugar. At this stage, in a modern kitchen, people use a torch and just torch over it. Today, however, since we are here in Charles Thompson's estate, Bruce, who is the historian, made me actually an 18th century salamander. And the salamander comes from a piece of metal that's on a stick that discolors itself. So it's been called salamander from the 17th, 18th century. That if you go to a kitchen today and the people say, put in the salamander, everybody knows it's like a cheese melter. So I have the salamander under fire. And basically what it is, it's just a piece of metal that's on a long stick. And the longer the stick, the better so that you don't burn yourself. I can hear it and I can see it. A little bit more. Get a nice golden crust. Ah, look at that. Amazing. What Beautiful. a job. Thank you, Thomas Jefferson. I guarantee you. That's the first time, at least that I know of, that anybody ever recreated a salamander and actually placed a creme brulee. Want to try? Yeah. Perfect. Boy, I'll tell you. Mm-hmm. Thin, crispy crust. It's only one word. Mm, so good. Spectacular <laughs> is the word. Exactly. Spectacular. Every time I go somewhere, every time I do an event, I always bring along one thing, tell them. Spice cookies. And why spice cookies? Because spice cookies really, really, really highlights the 18th century. Absolutely. So we're gonna start with uh, one half pound of butter, so two sticks, and it's, you know, nice and soft, room mm -hmm. temperature. Of course, you could do this in your mixer, but here we are. A half cup of sugar, and you really wanna make sure that you don't have any clumps of butter left over, which will burn and create holes in your cookies while they're baking. You just wanna make sure that you're incorporating the butter and the sugar until it's nice and soft and fluffy. Okay, so that looks nice. Yep, yep, next. We're gonna add some molasses. Even if you overbake them a little bit, they will still be chewy because of the molasses. And if you would, in that mortar and pestle over there, yep. we have freshly ground spices, which of course we use at the City Tavern for everything. So, about one and a half teaspoons of ground ginger. ginger. Very good. One and a half teaspoons of ground cinnamon. About a quarter teaspoon of ground clove. And one teaspoon of allspice. Spice. There we go. And you got a little Fantastic. bit of salt. Yes. And before we go any further, I want to get our eggs in here. Two yolks. Here we go. Number two. Perfect. You want to add your egg yolks in one at a time to make sure that they are incorporated fully before you add your flour. Two and a half cups of flour. And what flour we use? Just a regular all-purpose. This is a pretty soft dough once you get it all together. There you go. I'm going to get in here with my hands. You could easily th roll this into a log and have them ready to slice, slice at home. Um, I prefer a scoop and today we will just spoon them. There we are. Done. Beautiful. All right, so we have our chilled dough. I chilled it for 20 minutes in the mm -hmm. refrigerator, and you can see it's, you know, workable but mm -hmm. firm, not, you know, as soft as the other. So we'll just gather up a little spoonful here, roll it in our hands, and then what we have here is sanding sugar. The sanding sugar, as you can see, is nice and crystallized. It gets, gets the spark out of it. That's you know. exactly right. And then we'll just evenly space them. 
then it goes in the oven. Yes. Shall we try one? Of course. Fantastic. Like I said, this cookie everywhere I serve it, people go crazy. The flavors of the, the spice, especially the ginger and the nutmeg, the old spice comes right through it. Mm-hmm. Mm. Nice mm -hmm. and sparkly, good and soft. Mm. All right, chef. One of your favorites. Tell me what it is. They call it chocolate barks. We call it Diablo tin. Exactly, which means little devil. And why? Because everything is disguised in there. Today we have almond and ginger. You can do any variety. And then I'm going to chop just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Put your fingers. It's important to toast the nuts before so you get the real full flavor. Uh, it's nice and rich and toasty. Going to grab a little bit of our candied ginger here. This can be a little bit tough to cut because it is firm and chewy. So tell the people how to temper chocolate. It's very simple. All you need is a double boiler, one pot with about two inches of water. Bring it to a simmer, turn it off, and place a big glass bowl on top with your chocolate, something heat proof. And that's all she wrote. You can make this with white blueberries, with blackberries, with anything. You get the nice chewy texture of the dried fruit with the crunchy nuts, of course, and then just simple dark chocolate. If you go to a confection store, just call it chocolate bark, and they would know. That's right. And basically it's done. All you got to do there is scoop is. it out the size you want. I like them petite, like small like that. Exactly. Because there's a lot of calories packed in there. <laughs> That's correct. All you do is you put them on a tray. Just line it with parchment. And it sets up in no time at all. No time at all. Pop them in the fridge for about five or ten minutes, and they are beautiful and ready to go. Perfect. So again, once you've got them all spooned out, just pop them in the fridge. And you have that. And the end. Voila. It has been my pleasure introducing you to the city tavern that was first built and opened in 1773, where we work everything from scratch, from the farm to the table, with a full in-house bake shop. And speaking of bake shop, Diana, it's fantastic to have you here to help me out, to really show you and give you an appreciation what happened in the 18th century. 